Japan up close. So my first question is actually addressed to the both of you, and it's about the, the Japanese soft power. And as we know, it's such a wide concept uh, with several layers to it. And some people focus more on the political aspect, some others the cultural, the historical. So, Ms. Benaglia, how would you personally define the Japanese soft power? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, perhaps before starting, I would like to say that I'm indeed a specialist on soft power, but on the public diplomacy. So more as you highlighted correctly, the political aspect. So rather than the cultural attraction, which is very much the case for Japan, uh, but they specialize more on how you explain your own policy. This is uh, in a very brief uh, sentence, how I would explain public diplomacy. So, you know, how do you present your core um, political agenda to the rest of the world. And now, um, when it comes to my observation of how the soft power in general, and in particular, the public diplomacy power for Japan, um, it's rather interesting that starting from the huge cultural attraction that Japan obviously has, and it plays out, uh, but in a way, I mean, in its unique position, but it's not the only country in the world that has a unique and very big cultural to, to, to give out to the rest of the world. But what is rather unique for Japan is that they manage to um, get people attract, to attract the people through the cultural, but then have them interested in the social, political and social economy, economy of today's Japan. And this shift is actually rather unique and is rather very important because um, while again, the cultural attraction in a country can remain and can be big or small, you know, it depends on a number of variables. And of course, I can get more into the details on this, but uh, I stop here for now. Uh, for Japan, what is very interesting for the political mm, uh, observation is that they manage to attract people through the cultural attraction, but then have them interested in the contemporary Japan. And this is utterly important because you then have, you know, you create some sort of small ambassadors of your own policy. So um, this is, for me, the key of the Japanese soft power today. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting uh, point and very interesting way of putting it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Breckel, um, how would you define the Japanese soft power? Uh, so I would define Japanese soft power as uh, an overall image of uh, reliability and also friendli friendliness, perhaps. Uh, I think a lot of non-Japanese have an image of Japan as being quite uh, orderly, uh, like trains are always on time, uh, crime rate is low, and Japan is a very safe country. And I think since more and more uh, foreigners are visiting Japan as well, I think that they kind of get their images uh, confirmed as well. Uh, I think most people have heard stories about like lost wallets finding their way back to the its owner or like if you, if you lose something on a train in Japan, you usually get it back. Uh, so Japan is a very safe place. And also I think a lot of people that visit Japan, they come here to um, enjoy the food culture. And most people are familiar with Japanese food culture has a lot of uh, raw dishes a lot of raw fish, uh, obviously, sushi being the most famous. Uh, and I think that uh, although they have a lot of raw things, you very rarely hear about people getting sick in Japan. So I think that people feel very safe here, and not only because of the low crime rates, but also like you can eat anything without actually knowing what it is, but you know that you're going to be fine. So I think that um, it all kind of adds up to Japan as being a very reliable country. So I think that you, you're, not, you're not worried when you're in Japan. You, maybe you're lost, like culturally. Maybe you're lost because you don't know the language, but you're always safe. And I think this kind of adds up to an image of uh, Japan as a country that you can rely on and where you can always feel safe. Thank you very much. I can definitely relate to this. Uh, and both of your answers just show that confirms how um, complex and rich that concept of Japanese soft power is. Um, Ms. Benaglia, so in your experience, have you witnessed any influence of Japan's soft power on other countries or on people's daily lives? Well, I would uh, answer with uh, European 
perspective on this because I am observing the effect of Japanese soft power and again, more focusing on public diplomacy. I, I'm a public diplomacy expert myself, so I have these lenses um, while sitting in Brussels. So I have kind of like the recipient end um, view. Um, my work is also, um, I, I'm a foreign policy expert of the EU and I work on the Indo-Pacific. Now, I spell this out because until very recently, the Indo-Pacific was a foreign concept for Europeans. Um, let's not dwell into this. Um, but as a matter of fact, and I'm talking about pretty much over two years span, um, we, the Europeans started thinking about the Indo-Pacific. And in this, um, the Japanese definition of the of FOIP has been extremely important and extremely prominent influence in defining what the Indo-Pacific means for the European Union and its strategy. So this is a very concrete example of how the public diplomacy actually worked out in concrete terms uh, in Europe and how it influenced. Of course, we have other elements like, uh, well, we haven't yet uh, seen the results, but um, there, were, there is a Japan chair recently established in a prominent European um, university here in Brussels. So through these uh, tools, the Japan chair, you really have an impact and you see directly this link of how, you know, you by investing on people to people, so to say, public, this kind of public diplomacy, they manage to do it very effectively. So the investment has um, a high rate of return on investment, so to say. Um, and there is really, you know, the, again, looking at public diplomacy, so explaining main policies, you have a direct uh, impact. And this is rather unique in the soft power world because soft power doesn't always have this um, straightforward dynamic. It is much more blurred. Uh, it is not always one plus one equal two. But I think in the Japanese case is... Uh, it at least is much closer to this uh, to this dynamic. Thank you very much. Uh, following up on that question, do you do you feel or how do you think that Europe is leveraging its own soft power in Japan? Well, this can be a very long discussion <laughs> and very long topic. Um, keeping it extremely short, I think that. Um, the EU is still learning how to leverage its soft power in general and public diplomacy, um, despite acknowledging that public diplomacy is of paramount importance. It's notoriously always repeatedly flagged as a priority in foreign policy, but there is very little use strategically of these tools. So uh, it still remains a uh, a little bit of a um, theoretical more than a practical tool. And um, there is also a um, dimension of it is also how member states uh, understand it and contribute to making it an effective tool. And with this, I mean also how much public diplomacy and soft power still remains very much a national priority for European countries. So you rather have a French or a German or an Italian, and so the list goes on for 27 member states, rather than a real European approach and a European investment. So I think that both actually have a role to play in improving. I think that there are lessons that are increasingly being taken into consideration. So, you know, it, it's doing its own homework but we're not quite there yet. I see, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Breckel, how about uh, your experience? The, uh, uh, thank you, I'm, I'm gonna to return to the, uh, the cultural aspect here. Uh, I think certainly the, the consumption of Japanese culture uh, is getting increasingly more common among uh, foreigners, uh, especially in Europe, I think. When I, I remember when I was in high school, I started drinking Japanese tea and I very often tell that story whenever I get interviewed. But uh, at that time, to be interested in something Japanese was kind of like almost a subculture thing or kind of like almost a nerdy thing to do. I think nowadays, a lot of people are uh, either watching Japanese movies or anime, maybe they're reading manga. It's kind of like um, <clears throat> one alternative to all other types of entertainment that you have uh, out there. And of course, I have, do have to mention Japanese food as well, because I'm kind of part of the food and, and beverage uh, <laughs> um, 
genre myself. Uh, I think that for, nowadays, let's say that a lot of, especially for sushi, uh, most people are familiar with sushi, but even other Japanese dishes are getting increasingly more common. So people are kind of more familiar with the Japanese food these days. So whether it's food, anime, or Japanese products in general, I think that if you think of it, you have something Japanese in your home, and、uh, you probably have some person you know that is interested. In something Japanese, and it's much more common today.、Uh, it's not like considered strange or like subculture anymore. So, in that sense, I'd say that I could sense or like、uh, that I've kind of witnessed、uh, influence on people's daily life to to that extent. Thank you very much.、Uh, well, same for me. Like I come from Lebanon, which really have not much in common with Japan, and I have been. Noticing lately that there is more,、um, <laughs> it's more present, the Japanese culture there.、Um, so, Rekha, again, I would like to, I would like to dig a bit deeper into the tea history, and would like to ask you if、um, you think the Japanese culture of soft power is reflected in the Japanese tea history and the way it is served, or any other aspect of it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you look at how、uh, Japanese tea has been、uh, branded overseas. Uh, especially during like the Meiji era, for example, in the、uh, latter half of the、um, 19th century, when export of Japanese tea kind of really took off.、Uh, at the time, Japanese tea was mainly exported to the United States and Canada, but to other countries in Europe as well, to some degree. And whenever the Japanese went overseas to、um, do camp,、uh, they very often、um, introduced it by also introducing the Japanese tea ceremony. Which is、uh, all about hospitality and about making your guests feel as comfortable as possible. So I think uh, it's uh, they kind of I guess wanted to create an image of、uh, Japanese tea and Japanese tea drinking being something very peaceful, something very friendly, and、um, uh, that kind of、um, uh, probably made people think of Japan as a friendly nation as well. Uh, because well, tea, tea drinking is、uh, friendly and not very aggressive, so I think that has uh, definitely uh, led to people having a,、uh, an image of Jap- Japan as a friendly country. And I think you see that nowadays as well.、Uh, it has changed a little bit the way they promote tea, but、um, since because now it's more focused on the、um, the health benefits, but that's also something that is very sought after right now.、Um, health benefits of、uh, Tea drinking, or like、uh, people are getting more health oriented in general all across the globe, and I think in that sense, again, Japanese food, and not only tea, but you know, Japanese food culture as a whole has an image of being、uh, quite lean and healthy compared to many other food cultures. So、um, I think they're kind of riding on that wave, I suppose.、Uh, so before they used to have more the cultural aspects, the, the tea ceremonies, and、uh, now the Uh, weight has been sort of shifted.、Uh, a lot of focus is on the,、um, the health benefits now, but that's、uh, also a strong point, I suppose.、Uh, although it's kind of accidental, I mean,、uh, they didn't make、uh, well create tea as a superfood、uh, for modern people, but it just ended up being that way.、Uh, but I think it kind of leads to people having an image of、uh, uh, well, Japanese food culture and. Well, including tea drinking,、uh, something healthy in general. Thank you. Well, it is a good accident. <laughs>、um, so, regarding、uh, my last question, but、um, Miss Benaglia, with the current and drastic changes happening in the international community,、uh, do you see or do you expect、uh, any changes to happen to Japan's soft power as we know it? Well,、um, yeah, you're right in、um, spelling out that indeed the global、uh, situation is changing, and、uh, we are witnessing objectively, you know,、uh, an increase of tension, especially in the Indo-Pacific, which by extension will have、um, impact on how Japan does. Uh, soft power, so I expect to have a shift more from the cultural diplomacy to the public diplomacy again. So you know,、uh, investing more in explaining the policies because、um, the context, perhaps with an oversimplification, 
if a couple of decades ago um, there was a strong emphasis on business relations with Europe, again, I'm looking mostly at Europe in uh, Japan relations. Right now, of course, the relations needs and both actors actually want it to grow into a more geostrategic dimension. So for this to happen, of course, you need to have a, an increased role of public diplomacy Therefore, better and uh, even more um, emphasis on explaining the objectives, priorities, how to work together, because this is um, a necessity of today's time. You are completely right. Thank you very much for this. And Mr. Breckel, how do you see the or expect the changes well, to happen? Two, yeah, I think there are two aspects here. Well, first of all, I think that uh, Japan has become... Um, well, a lot closer to many people. Uh, if you compare like a couple of decades ago, a lot more people are traveling to Japan. So, but well, both the tourists and also people coming here for work and the number of uh, foreigners living in Japan has been on the increase too in the last couple of years. So I think that in that sense, whatever Japan has to offer, like we mentioned earlier, the reliability, the food culture, um, <clears throat> uh, I think that uh, it will be more, uh, it will be it kind of uh, felt uh, more strongly felt by people because you actually um, you can actually visit Japan now or people feel like they can visit Japan it's not just a mysterious country in the far east it's uh, actually a place where you can go so I think people are getting more familiar in Japan and uh, that's one aspect of it and also I think um, because of the uh, well geopolitical situation as well uh, Japan being the second largest economy after China in the Far East and having, uh, well, being very close both to Russia, China, uh, North and South Korea, it's, uh, it's in a quite delicate position and, and not, not to mention Taiwan. So I think that uh, the way Japan is um, conducting diplomacy with, um, with its neighboring countries and the way kind of Japan manages to and move on in the midst of all the, uh, all the chaos will probably be more highlighted maybe. I think for a, for a long time, uh, we haven't probably thought of Japan as a country that you need to pay attention to when it comes to diplomacy and like geopolitics. And Japan has been a strong economy, it's been strong like culturally, but I think maybe from now on increasingly, uh, it will be kind of highlighted as a country who, well, that, as a country that kind of navigates through this chaos with all the, um, well, having, uh, well, sh sharing uh, borders or being very close to uh, both Russia and China. And yeah, so it's, gonna, it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen in the region. I hope we'll be able to maintain peace here, of course. Uh, but um, I think in, in any case, I think that uh, Japan will probably be uh, more highlighted, definitely. Other countries will probably look at how Japan has been navigated uh, or been able to navigate itself so far. So, yeah. Thank you. It will definitely be very interesting to see how things will progress from here on. Um, well, I would like to thank you very much for this very informative and interesting discussion. I personally learned a lot, and I'm sure the audience will really enjoy watch it and watching it and learn a lot from it. Thank you very much for your time again and your very um, important observations. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Thank you very much. Wonderful... It was a pleasure. The pleasure was all mine. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful evening. Yes. Thank you. Day. Likewise. Or evening. <laughs> Thank you. Time it is. All right. Thank you. Bye. Very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Japan up close.